Hey, welcome to the lake. I live on Lake Conroe. And this video is going to be about making a custom lampshade for the different steps that we went through working with a good friend. Probably the most important part was that we listened to each other and we figured out a solution in the end that made them both very happy. Hope this video gives you some idea of what's involved in my process. And thanks for stopping by. As artists, we all like to work with our friends. And a good friend of mine came by and said, Hey, uh, I had a lampshade break. Could you make one? I know you work in glass. And could I work with you? And I said, Sure. This sounds like a fun project. Not quite sure how we're going to make it, but we'll figure it out. So this is what he presented me with. A wire frame and a little piece of glass that was a remnant of what was broken on the inside. You can see that the wire frame fit on the outside and the glass was on the inside. So this is Larry. He's a great guy. He's a super neighbor and his wife Lynn. They live just around the corner from us. He's an airline pilot as well as an educator. A lot of fun, really smart guy always up for a challenge and a great gardener. So here we go. We had to design a blank. Larry had never worked in glass. So I showed him how I oftentimes lay blanks out. We took a piece of paper. We came up with some organic designs that we could uh, trace onto the paper after I'd cut out a 22 inch circle of tech to glass. So that was our base. So we had the tech to underneath. Then we took some um, Egyptian blue streaky glass and we cut that up into uh, organic shapes that we could lay out. We added two frits to this. We added some medium amber fine and also added some uh, opaline striker coarse to give a little bit of texture and depth. So Larry got a spoon out and we started placing the fret in between our pieces that we had cut out of the blue streaky. So we got this into the kiln. Uh, we cleaned up the edges and uh, it was ready to fire. It was fired on a sheet of thin fire paper. It fired beautifully. Nice texture, good depth, little irregular edges. I offered to trim those off, but Larry said, no, I like the irregularity. So we moved on to the next step. How in the world were we going to slump this into a big mold that wasn't made? So the next step, we had to figure out how to make a mold to have this slump into. Uh, there are several great resources online. One is Bullseye uh, that I use through Facebook. Uh, another uh, direction I was sent to was a way to make a ceramic mold. I contacted a good friend, Carol Berger, who told me about using some B-Mix, that I could fire this in my glass kiln, but this would take a long time. So the next step is I posted uh, this to uh, lunch with a glass artist and did a presentation on one of their Sherlocking events, and uh, this was great. Uh, pretty much everybody who uh, attended that event said they had not had experience making a mold this big. Wished me a lot of luck. And uh, during that presentation, I was introduced to uh, Barbara Cashman, who happened to dial in. Boy, was I lucky. So the interesting thing about talking with Barbara Cashman is she has a product that uh, is pretty safe. Uh, if you used a fiber uh, product with rigidizer, you have to wear respirators and the like, and I like this. So uh, reading uh, her information on our website, we bought some silk mat. One of the things she said to do was be sure and pre-fire the silk mat because it may shrink some. So we did that. We uh, fired a whole sheet in the kiln. Be sure you don't have a kiln shelf in place. Um, if you do the rapid ramp up because it'll break the kiln shelf, luckily I didn't have that. 
We fired this at 100 degrees an hour up to 1450 and held it for 30 minutes. Once it was fired, it uh, definitely shrank about a little over an inch. So the next thing we did was buy some of her rigidizer. The rigidizer that she suggests doesn't have a flame uh, to it, and so I was very happy with that. We coated the wire uh, frame with some uh, blue painter's tape to keep us uh, so that the mold would not fall in there. We sprayed it with Pam and that worked as a good release agent. The mold was uh, then uh, placed underneath the uh, rigidized uh, sheet of silk mat and held in place with some clamps because it required a couple pleats to keep this uh, mold shape in place. My concern was I had a heavy piece of glass that was going to be sitting on top of this and I didn't want these uh, pleats to open up so I added some pants over vests with uh, adding some pieces of leftover stainless steel that I bolted uh, to keep these uh, pleats tight. We fired the mold to harden it. Uh, once it was fired it got much more rigid. The mold itself had some openings on the sides. We could have cut a piece of glass in the center and that would have been a little over 18 and a half inches. But Larry wanted to keep the full 22 inch uh, blank that we had fired. So we scratched our head and said, well, let's see, maybe we can put a donut around the outside uh, and attach that to this form and uh, then we'd have the right form and shape to support the glass so we could fire it. We fired another sheet of uh, silk mat. Once that was done, we cut it into a donut shape. Uh, that donut shape would slip over the mold we had and give us support. That was our thoughts and it worked out perfect. So when I had done the first mold, I hadn't used the PAM and I highly recommend that. It doesn't stick, it worked great. So we added the rigidizer to this donut. Larry did a great job helping me. The rigidizer is messy, so wore gloves, and I put some plastic down on the table that we were working on. It took a fair amount of rigidizer to uh, get this soaked. Uh, in, and all in all, in making these molds, we used almost four quarts of rigidizer. So we placed this donut underneath and then placed the old mold on top. I used some glass for it, hold the mold down. It took about three days for this to dry out. After it was dried out, we used uh, some stainless steel thread that I bought from Barbara. I used a whip stitch. My mother used to teach home economics, and I think that's what this is called. And that held this... Uh, inner rim in place so it uh, wouldn't pop off during the firing. Once you added the uh, uh, interior, once this was coated with uh, shelf primer, uh, these uh, stitches uh, pretty much went away. So then we had a big support for our rim. It was placed into the kiln and fired um, so that uh, it would be hardened again. Made sure to uh, support the underside of the uh, base so that heat could get underneath that. And as I was firing it, I was just curious what was happening in there. I opened the kiln around 500 degrees and it was discolored. That discoloration all went away once it was fully fired. We uh, then used uh, some uh, bullseye shelf primer on the inside. Barbara suggests that you don't have to use this unless you're using opalescent glass, and we were, so I used shelf primer. Uh, this was then pre-fired to 500 degrees uh, so that we made sure that all the water was gone. Once that was gone, we set up the mold to do a big slump. We made sure the mold was level. Once that was level in all directions, we placed the glass on the mold and uh, program the kiln for a big slump. When you're firing a piece this big you need to make sure that it's centered in your kiln and uh, we did some measurements to make sure that the glass was centered on the, the form and that the uh, slump mold was actually centered in the kiln as we didn't have a lot of extra space 
around the outside of the mold during the sloping. This is the program that I use for the slump. Uh, this is a very low uh, temperature slump. Uh, started at 100 degrees an hour to 1,000 degrees. There was a one hour hold. Then I programmed three different temperatures into my uh, kiln. So if I needed to add additional heat, I could. I had a temperature at 1125, which I used for an hour and 30 minutes. I used 1150 for 15 minutes and 1180 for 10 minutes. So I was getting close to the bewitching hour and I need to go to sleep and I wanted to finish this slump. This program worked great. Uh, we had a good slump. I have elements in the top of my kiln, so I need to heat very slowly. Uh, and this worked really well. You'll see in the next pictures how uh, the temperature was right after the 1,000 uh, degree hold. We were starting to get some slumping already. The uh, glass stayed nicely centered. The kiln was open just for a couple seconds so I could take a picture. Uh, and then uh, we moved on. Uh, as the night went on, uh, we uh, added more heat to the glass. And again, we slumped very, very, very slowly. When you slump slowly like this, you get a really nice texture on the inside and the outside of your glass that doesn't pick up a whole lot of texture uh, on the area of the slump. Here's some pictures at uh, 9.38 and then at 10 p.m. Uh, you can see how the temperatures are going up. Uh, then at 10.55 we used 11.80 for the last couple minutes just to get some extra heat to get the bottom to drop. And I finished the slump at about 11 o'clock. This slump started uh, about uh, 10 o'clock in the morning and it was done by 11 o'clock at night and then went on to an annealing phase. We got a beautiful texture on the inside of the glass as well as the outside of the glass. The uh, silk mat picked up a little bit of texture just on the rim, which actually Larry and uh, his wife really like how it diffracts the light. This slump was about six and a half inches tall and was done all in one uh, firing. Next, we need to drill a hole in the bottom of the glass. Uh, Larry had bought some diamond bits uh, with some water in the bottom of the vessel. We gradually and very slowly used the diamond bit to drill a hole. These were diamond core bits. Uh, this was done in two stages. The glass uh, powder for the bit clouded what I was seeing, so we poured it out and put some fresh water in, and then we were able to finish uh, drilling the hole. Again, use your drill on very, very slow speed, and gradually work yourself through this hole uh, it worked out beautiful. Once the hole was drilled, there were just some uh, sharp areas around that hole that we needed to address. And the next thing we did was move over to my diamond flat lap. It's a Covington variable speed 12 inch uh, flat lap with some diamond cones and this works great. So I have a 12 inch Covington flat lap with some diamond cones that work great for finishing edges. And it worked great for uh, trimming off this interior portion. You need to make sure that the cone doesn't get stuck. So you don't want to push it all the way down and go gradually on the sides. Just trim the cone up nice uh, to a nice smooth rib. And uh, I think Larry was more excited about this than I was because I've done this several times before. So the next step was to figure out how to get this mold on the outside rather than the inside. So what we had to do is refabricate it. So we had to cut each portion of the outer rim, put some new metal in there, which I welded in place. We also welded a base in there because the support that he had prior would have only uh, held the glass on a quarter inch rim and that uh, was too big a piece of glass and that would have broken. 
So we had a nice space, um, and we rebuilt the lamp. And we got the uh, wires redone, base redone. We bolted on this steel plate at the bottom to the top of the lamp. And then it was time to apply some silicone and glue this top on. I've used this uh, GE silicone that's 100% uh, as a uh, way to put glass together. It has excellent adhesion and works great. We leveled the glass and we taped it so that it wouldn't move as the uh, silicone adhesive dried. So, it was fun to see the lamp as it emerged once we took the tape off. Beautiful, beautiful shape and contour. Metal shape now fit on the outside and the uh, base all worked nicely together. Uh, we were looking for a way to light it up and we found actually a light bulb with some metal on the outside. And that was a great addition and uh, formed a great uh, light from our friends. So, what I'd say was a wonderful project with a great friend. It took us about a month of different steps and drying stages, but once it was delivered to their home, Larry sent me this wonderful picture at night uh, with a big smile. This was a great project. It's a lot of fun. It took a little scratching our heads to make sure that it all worked out, but in the end it worked out great. If you'd like to learn more about my work, you can go to my webpage at www.alhalmanart.com. My Instagram handle is alhalmanart. I have a long history of working and fabricating and making things with my hands. I've worked for many years as a spine surgeon. I'm now retired and I do art as a way to keep me occupied uh, and challenged. Uh, working with friends and doing commissions where we can both come up with solutions that work out for both of us is a lot of fun. And hopefully this uh, gave you a glimpse into my process, uh, how we solved some interesting problems and came out with a result that we're both happy with. Bye for now.